Good morning from Miami Beach, the home of Neurosurgical TV. We have, have the pleasure of having another Jordan Neurosurgery Grand Rounds, also with the Turkish, Turkish neurosurgeon, Kare Azduman, and we have Abraham Sabaya, who's been doing these uh, weekly educational sessions for 27 years, 27, right? 28 now. 28, 28 years, and lately he's picked up uh, the technology of Zoom, and we're glad he did. Okay, uh, Abraham, welcome. It's all yours. Thank you. Right. Um, so my name is Abraham Sweh. I'm uh, talking to you from Amman, Jordan, from the Farah Medical Campus uh, here in Amman. And uh, I would say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you have. And today we have a very provocative uh, topic that is the cranial pharyngioma, uh, whether we should be treating it partial excision or total excision, whether we should be giving radiation. It's a very going to be a very hot uh, topic. And uh, I'll be doing this with my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Corey Osdeman from Ajivadam University Hospital in, uh, in Istanbul. And I'll be talking about the surgical part uh, of management of the craniopharyngioma and Professor Osdeman will be talking about the uh, radiosurgery. Uh, I always put this to you. Uh, this is the black iris, which is the symbol of Jordan. So the origin of cranial pharyngioma is well known to all of us. We have two pouches, one coming from the mouth, one coming from the brain. They meet together to form the pituitary gland. Uh, this is called Rathke's pouch. We're talking about eight weeks of the gestation. And uh, the remnant of this cleft or pouch may develop into tumors like Rathke's cleft cysts or cranial pharyngioma or any other type of lesions in that area. Uh, the cranial pharyngiomas, in, in terms of location, uh, 5 to 10 percent are within the cella, 80 85 percent are supracellular. And when we say a supracellular, it could be anterior to the chiasm, posterior chiasm, or both of them. But this is the majority of the lesions, supracellular. The intracellular and the, uh, the ones that are confined to the third ventricle are minority. So 5 percent here, 10 percent here. Uh, this paper from Spain uh, by uh, Jose uh, Maria Pascal, uh, intra-chiasmatic cranial pharyngioma within the chiasm itself. Uh, I will start like this. I am an advocate of radical accession of cranial pharyngioma. Uh, I'd like to state this at the very beginning. And I hate statements like this which says result of radical excision is not superior to partial excision and radiotherapy. This really is very much irritating for me because I think this is sending the wrong message to the younger neurosurgeons because usually they translate this to do the minimum and send for radiotherapy. So we have to be careful of what we say. Uh, in many parts of the world, the major lines of management including Jordan, Middle East, third world countries, and many other countries in the world, cyst puncture, Omega reservoir insertion, VP shunts, minimal resection followed by radiation. This is, we have to admit, we have to accept that this is a fact. This is the way cranial pharyngioma has been managed in most of the, of the world, and we have to change this, uh, these lines of treatment. Uh, this, this paper by Edward Lowe's, who is, as you know, is a very famous neurosurgeon. He was the chairman of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Society and chairman of the American Society of Surgery. Uh, he's retired now. Uh, he wrote this in the, uh, in the journal about expert corner. Let me read it with you, because this is the common thing that we are facing. In June 92, at the age of four, a Hispanic boy underwent placement of right ventricular shunt for his cranial pharyngioma. That's in Mexico. 
followed by placement of a left ventricular blood vent shunt in July. He underwent terrorial craniotomy with biopsy and aspiration. Craniopharyngioma was diagnosed. August, he had VP shunts were revised. October 92, in the States, patient underwent a transcalosal craniotomy for excision of the tumor. He was followed by radiation therapy. The tumor recurred and so on and so on and so on. This is the story everywhere in the world. This is the commonest story. And Ed Laws would tell you, unfortunately, case history like this is not rare. People think this is the rare thing. No, this is the commonest thing. This is the practice in the whole world like this with a few, with a few exceptions. And he would comment on that particular case report. He would say like many patients with the craniopharyngioma, this patient could have been managed differently. Simple aspiration of the cyst would not help. Attempt at radical removal should be considered. Cystic recurrences are resistant to radiation. So I'm talking about radical excision of a craniopharyngioma. And this is what I'm advocating. I published this, uh, the laminar terminalis approach for third ventricular craniopharyngioma and the Journal of Scalpel Surgery Supplement. June 20, uh, 2012. And I also published this paper recently, 2017, with my colleague uh, Abu Farsah, a differential expression of immunohistochemistry markers for epithelial squamous cells in adamantinoma craniopharyngiomas. So we are very much in it in uh, the uh, topic of craniopharyngioma. Uh, let me take you a quick uh, walk through history of craniopharyngioma. Uh, Albert von Zinker back in uh, the 1825 to 1898. He was the first man to describe craniopharyngioma. Jacob Erdheim, he described the histological types of the craniopharyngioma. Babinski, the same man of Babinski, Joseph Babinski, he described the clinical presentation of the craniopharyngioma. Uh, Sir Victor Horsley, this paper uh, in the Journal of Neurosurgery, Sir Victor Horsley, pioneer of a craniopharyngioma surgeon. Lots of you would not know that Victor uh, Horsley was buried in Iraq uh, in the Middle East. He was a pioneer of uh, craniopharyngioma surgery. Harvey Cushing, who uh, reported uh, many cases of a craniopharyngioma, uh, but he was the one who did the first transphenoidal surgery in 1909. Uh, he reported 92 craniopharyngiomas out of something like 2,000 brain tumors, which he did. Norman Dot was a student of uh, Harvey Cushing. He trained with him there, and when he left, he said, don't tell anybody about the secrets of this approach. And Norman Dot uh, went back to England. Uh, just a coincidence that Norman Dot was the mentor of my boss, David Attlee, uh, in, in London. He passed his information to uh, uh, Gerard Goyer, who uh, revived the transphenoidal approach in France. Julius Hardy took over also uh, in Montreal doing the transnasal approaches for pituitary and craniopharyngiomas. Charlie Wilson in the United States, University College of San Francisco, has done something like 3,500 3, pituitary tumors. He died recently, unfortunately. And this paper by uh, Harold Hoffman in Canada back in 77, 19th century, he was speaking about the radical accession of craniopharyngioma. Uh, Professor uh, Ghazi Yazajil, Muhammad Ghazi Yazajil, reported his cases back in 1990, 144 patients, total removal of craniopharyngioma in the majority of these patients. It laws from Harvard, who also was the, as I said, the president of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. He was here in Amman with us so many times, uh, with our wives here in, uh, in California. Uh, look what he says in the Hormone Research Pediatric Journal. Unfortunately, non-surgical options have provided limited benefits while incurring their own risks. Non-surgical options should be reserved as adjuvant therapy following surgical management. Look at this statement. The best long-term outcomes have been reported following a gross total resection. You cannot deny all these evidences. 
uh, I mentioned that already. Majid Sami reported 65 cases, giant ones with a gross total resection in the majority of them. Uh, also, uh, Falbush, uh, Rudolf Falbush also reported a complete craniopharyngioma accession with acceptable morbidity in 80 to 90 percent of cases is possible. Uh, and here is uh, with my friend uh, Nelson Osiko in the International Society of Vitutary Surgery, where this is being repeatedly uh, reported. Radical accession of craniopharyngioma is the best uh, outcome in these cases. From Argentina in 2005, radical resection of craniopharyngioma. Uh, again, from the United States uh, 2005, total resection provided the best outcome. That is craniopharyngioma in children. And this paper by Wizov, also from the States, efficacy and safety of radical resection of a primary and recurrent. So even if you have a recurrent craniopharyngioma surgery, remains the best option. Uh, Sam al Mefti, total removal of giant retrochasmatic craniopharyngioma. Uh, this is from Christian St. John, uh, St. Rose. Uh, Christian John is, one, is a major pediatric neurosurgeon in in Paris, France, what looks what he look what he says. The best overall results are achieved with complete resection by experienced craniopharyngioma surgeon. This is not a place for novices or for beginners. This should be done by experienced craniopharyngioma, and that's why I refer to. If we keep saying that radical excision is equal to partial excision radiotherapy, non-experienced neurosurgeons, uh, mediocre surgeons would go and just do a biopsy and then you know, refer them for uh, radiotherapy. So uh, the, 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 the advice from Christian St. Rose is radical accession. And uh, from China, radical accession. Uh, again, from, from China, craniopharyngioma, surgical experience of radical, total tumor resection is feasible with the preservation of vital structures. So we have to stop speaking about this that these are uh, uh, lesions that you cannot remove. From Korea 2015, is complete resection of grain of endurance and not all feasible? The answer is yes, yes, with very strong words there. Uh, from Mayo Clinic, pediatric grain of endurance, a primer for the skull based surgeons. And this is the uh, from Mayo Clinic, maximal safe resection by a microsurgery or endoscopy provides very good tumor control. We are not here debating whether microsurgery is better or, uh, or endoscopy is better. We are debating that a radical excision by whatever mean is the uh, solution for these uh, people. Uh, again, here from Japan, 2018, radical resection of the craniopharyngioma, 81 patients. Uh, from Japan also 2005, surgical management of recurrence. Even for recurrence, the main theme is, is surgery. Now I, I'll, I'll stop here at this man, Jose Maria Pascual from Madrid, Spain. He wrote the most, he is the prophetic uh, uh, paper writing. And uh, he actually did lots of landmark papers. This uh, paper, describing the displacement of mammillary bodies by craniopharyngiomas. So you can see that the mammillary bodies are moving on the, on, on, on the side. So if you remove this, you will not damage the hypothalamus. Now this is the value of this paper. He also looks like this mammillary body here, mammillary body here. So this floor has been opened by the tumor. And he also described the angle of the mammillary body uh, describing uh, the uh, location of these tumors according to the angle that the mammillary body forms with the brainstem. Uh, this paper also by Jose Maria Bascal, predictive factors for craniopharyngioma recurrence. Another paper by the man. He is very prolific in, in writing papers on craniopharyngiomas, uh, and uh, he described the adherence of these craniopharyngiomas. Why people are afraid of it? There are adhesions there, but we have to understand these adhesions. And he would describe this in his paper by saying there is a small adhesion here, like a pedicle here, or like a sessile, like here, or 
cat-like, the adhesions are on the top of the, of the tumor, like this. Or they are on the bottom of the tumor, bowel-like, like this. Or they are surrounding the tumor, ring-like, like this. Or they are circumferential, surrounding the tumors. And he would tell you that the worst outcome comes from these uh, tumors. So the radiology would tell you whether you will be able to remove it or not. But remember this golden rule that the decision whether you can remove it completely or not is intraoperative and not preoperative. Again here, the, the craniopharyngioma recurrence, the impact of the tumor recovery by the same Jose Maria Pascual from Madrid. And he would describe the topography of the tumor, the shape of the tumor. Is it occupying the optic chiasm? What kind of chiasm distortion? Is it distorting the stoke? What is the mammalian body angle? What is the relationship with the hypothalamus and the third ventricle? And he would provide you with this beautiful thing. These here is the adhesions. Here is the mammalian body and here is the tumor. So the adhesions here in the primary tumors are the same like in recurrent tumors. So the value of this paper that even in the recurrent tumor, you can still find the plane of the cleavage, though it would be more vascular than the primary cases, but you can still remove the tumor radically. So he also described the adhesions. Are they loose or tight? Is there any plane of the cleavage? In his very beautiful paper here, so this is the adhesions, loose, tight, fusion, replacement kind of adhesions with the uh, surrounding structures. And he also described in 500 cases of craniopharyngioma, I think he has done the major part of the craniopharyngioma surgery in the world, he found that they are attached to the optic chiasm, uh, the 56%, third ventricular floor, 54%, the walls of the third ventricle, 23%, stroke, 19%. And he described the morphology of the attachment as I said, like a cap or whatever. Another paper in the same preoperative assessment of a craniopharyngioma adherence, uh, also looking at the radiology and see whether there are adhesions there or not to help you decide whether you should go for radical excision or not. Again, the final decision is intraoperative and not uh, uh, assessment of postoperative complications in craniopharyngioma, again by Jose Maria Pascal, uh, describing the uh, uh, craniopharyngiomas associated with the low risk, because they are attached here to the floor, but not invading it. And these high risk where they have uh, vulgarated the, uh, uh, and invaded the, the, the hypothalamus. Uh, the other man who wrote a lot about uh, uh, craniopharyngioma is uh, Jarai Stino from uh, Bratislava, uh, Slovak Republic. And he also described the tumor third ventricular relationship. And he uh, would tell us that there are extraventricular, so you can see the floor of the ventricle not invaded, or intraventricular, or intra extraventricular. So we have to do differentiate these uh, types from each other. And in his paper, he asked this question, craniopharyngiomas in children, how radical should the surgeon be? And the answer is radical removal with the preoperative planning. But the final decision about the optimal extent of the tumor should be done during surgery. So one should be radical. And these are the major surgical series advocating the uh, radical excision. These are the giants of a neurosurgery advocating radical excision to avoid recurrence and avoid multiple procedures and radiotherapy. It's there for anybody to read. I'm just listing them. Uh, let's uh, go through anatomy of the third ventricle. Uh, again, I think this is the anatomy of the third ventricle is one of the most difficult anatomical features in the brain. And I think this is one of the reasons why people do not understand how to do surgery in the third ventricular area. Uh, so this is a 3D uh, visualization of the ventricular system. And we are talking about uh, a region of the third ventricle like here. This is the sulcus between the thalamus and the hypothalamus. So one has to understand the relationship with the, with the uh, cross cerebri, with the midbrain, with the thalamus. Uh, so this piece of anatomy is essential to operate in these areas. 
And when it comes to the third ventricle, uh, this is the anterior wall, which is the lamina terminalis. Uh, this is the roof, which is the body of the fornix. Underneath it is the internal cerebral vein and the coronal plexus. The posterior wall, again, the vein of gallon and the uh, part of the uh, corpus callosum. The floor is made of the mammillary bodies and the tuber sinearum and then the stroke. That's if you are looking from below. And if you are looking from above, you can see that this is the nerve, nerve opticiasm, uh, optic recess, and then you can see the stroke here. And then this is the floor of the ventricle. And this is the view from the endoscope where you can find this area to go through the uh, endoscope to do third ventriculostomy. This is, of course, the aqueduct. The lateral wall here of the hypothalamus here contains these nuclei of the hypothalamus, which are arranged uh, in, in uh, groups. So this is the third ventricle, and this is the sulcus between the thalamus and the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus looks like a head of a bird with a peak here. The mammary body, tuber sinearum, and then the stroke goes in. Lamina terminalis, the roof, the posterior wall, and the floor. So hypothalamus has the control over pituitary, sympathetic, and parasympathetic. It's only four grams in weight, but it controls every essence of our lives. And the nuclei in the hypothalamus are arranged in three groups, according to the sagittal plane, anterior, middle, and posterior group. Uh, these four grams of structure, the hypothalamus, has control over food intake, uh, fluid intake, metabolism, growth, sex production, temperature control, circulation control, sleep, wake up cycle, attack, defense memory. So it controls the essence of our life in a whole fashion. And the, the, uh, the uh, nuclei of an anterior or middle like this. So anterior group, middle group, posterior group, preoptic, suprachiasmatic, supraoptic, middle group, the arcuate, which is in the floor of the third ventricle, paraventricular, medial, and lateral, posterior are tuberomamillary, mammillary, and lateral. These groups are associated with vasopressin and DI. This is associated with the satiety center, with how much we eat, and this is, is associated with the uh, sympathetic functions. Again, the uh, nuclei of the uh, third ventricle of the hypothalamus arranged in pairs from anterior to posterior. As I said, this is the anterior group, preoptic, suprachiasmatic, supraoptic, and this is the middle group, arcuate, paraventricular, medial, and lateral, and the posterior group of the nuclei, which is, as I said, associated with the sympathetic function. So this is the whole sum putting all together pre-optic, supraoptic, and then the paraventricular, ventromedial, ventrilateral, and the most posterior is the mammillary body. So people are afraid to operate upon here because of these nuclei, but understanding the anatomy would help. Now this is a, a coronal view, and again, this is the third ventricle, and they are also arranged uh, into three groups, the paraventricular, uh, the periventricular, paraventricular, and the lateral groups. The other piece of anatomy that one has to remember is the Lilliquist membrane, which arises from the dorsum cilli and goes here to the diencephalon and then separate here to mesencephalon. So it has two sheets like this. And recently there has been description of another uh, sheet of uh, Lilliquist going downward. So this is the diencephalic leaf in, in blue and this is the mesencephalic leaf in, in uh, orange. And this is how the Lilliquist membrane looks on radiology. So you can uh, appreciate this. So if one sees a lesion in the area of the pituitary and supracellular area, one has differential diagnosis. The first one that comes to mind are the pituitary adenomas, Rutkes cleft cysts, epidermoids, because they look like craniopharyngiomas, hypothalamic hamartoma. This is one of my patients one-year-old uh, male patient with precocious puberty and large uh, genitalia. Germinomas in that area are common. Uh, teratoma, histocytosis, optic gliomas, astrocytoma, lymphoma, chordoma. I'm presenting my cases and not anybody else's cases. These are all my cases. Plasmacytoma, cytoma, carcinoma, metastasis, 
sarcoidosis. This case is not mine. This is from Osborne book of radiology. Uh, meningioma, cordplex papilloma, oligodendroglioma, arachnoid cyst, and vestigial neuroblastoma. So all these comes into differential diagnosis of uh, these lesions. What is the management of craniopharyngiomas? Surgery, radionucleotide, chemotherapy, stereotactic radiotherapy or conventional radiotherapy. I will uh, put the concentration in my talk upon the surgery. But whatever, whatever you are doing, whatever method of treatment, you have to have a dedicated team. You just cannot operate as a surgeon on a craniopharyngioma without having these people around you who are very informed, informed well informed people of anesthesia, neurology, endocrinology, ophthalmology, neuroradiology, neuropathology, and radiation crisis. These are a must to proceed. This is a teamwork and not a per one person work. Uh, so the debate here is, should we be doing radical resection without radiotherapy or should we be doing partial resection and give radiotherapy? The pendulum swings between the two. And uh, here is the summary. If you do radical resection, definitely, no doubt, no confusion and no debate here. Less recurrence than when you do partial resection and, radi and uh, radiotherapy. Less procedures, no doubt about that. Here you have to have many procedures. Uh, and here they are subjecting the patient to complication of radiation here, not. People differ here, degree of hypothalamic and endocrine dysfunction, and I will allude to this later on. So radical approach, I believe in radical approach. Lots of people like me believe, I am like them believing in radical approach because we found that you frequently find a gliotic border that you can use and the neurosurgeon experience has an impact on the extent of resection. That's why this is not a place for the juniors, for the uh, people who are not experienced. Uh, I believe starting complete resection is a virtual <laughs> I believe that uh, people or surgeons and neurosurgeons um, are two types uh, and depends on their state of mind. Some people, they have decided from the word go, from the year of residency and whenever they started neurosurgery, that craniopharyngiomas are just for a small piece of biopsy and the Omega reservoir shunt and radiotherapy. This is the state of mind that we have to change. We have to change into a state of mind where I want to take this tumor completely. I want to kill it. I want to save my patient from all the other uh, uh, management lines. Uh, the complications of the treatment are uh, aligned on the pituitary, on the hypothalamus, on the optic apparatus, on the brainstem, on the temporal lobes, and we have the general neurosurgical complications the recurrence and the mortality. Uh, hydrocephalus can develop in these patients, muscular injury, of course, cranial nerves injury and seizures. Uh, hormonal treatment, uh, pre-treatment usually 25% are affected, post-treatment uh, the number increases. So uh, let me state this, that no one who had the craniopharyngioma had a better improvement of his endocrinology possible. They are either the same or worse, and we have to follow them uh, in a uh, very or long periods of time, whatever you are doing, partial or complete resection. Hypothalamus and the fearsome complication is obesity. I will also allude to this uh, sleep disturbance, temperature disturbance, and psychological disturbance. Uh, people are two types either you have obesity before you treat it, and this usually uh, stays, or you develop obesity post the treatment. And usually this disappears after treatment. And I will show you this. Visual, uh, you have it before treatment and after treatment. Sometimes they are permanent. Uh, of course, you have the recurrence, which makes the, uh, the, the dissection and the excession uh, difficult. In my experience, I found that the, uh, the, the recurrence are somehow the same like a primary uh, virgin cases in some cases, they were much nicer and easier. So not in my experience. Prognosis, the survival rate in most of the cases is good once you do the job properly. German channel registry, 98% five year overall survival. What are the bad practices that we are seeing in Jordan, in, in the Middle East, in the third world countries? 
insertion of Omeya reservoir. This is taken as an upfront treatment. I think this is um, this is a crime against humanity. Uh, I mean, I really am convinced about that. Uh, Omeya is Ayub Khan Omeya, a Pakistani neurosurgeon who immigrated to from Oxford. Uh, he was trained there and he uh, left the United States. And there he was given the task of trying to think of something, how to put intrathecal uh, medications into cancer patients into the ventricles. And he found this on my reservoir back in 65. So when he invented his reservoir, he invented it to, as, a, as a way of injecting the uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agents and uh, the analgesia and the antibiotics into the ventricle. He never envisaged that 80%, 90% of the neurosurgeons of the world will be doing this as an upfront treatment of craniopharyngeal. Uh, so this is his uh, original description. And look at this. They are doing nothing. Blockage, revision, this, that, and the other, they have done nothing. But this is a disaster if a boss would tell his uh, residents that this is the way of treatment of these craniopharyngeals. Uh, look at this paper from Brazil, cortical seeding of craniopharyngioma along the, uh, the uh, Omeya Reservoir. And look at this statement from Mayo Clinic, 2018. This is very recent. Omeya Reservoir is a palliative uh, uh, used only in resistant cases, should never be considered as a first line treatment. This is a clear statement. Why people are insisting that they use the Omeya Reservoir as an upfront treatment it defies my intelligence, it defies my, my, my humanity and everything. Other bad practice is a shunt without even attempt to remove the tumor because as I said, the state of mind of these people is I'm not gonna remove the tumor, so I will put a shunt. And when you ask him, why did you put a shunt? He would tell you, I want to save the patient's life. It was in the middle of the night. I don't know why all these hydrocephalus it gets crazy in the middle of the night. Okay, I agree with you, middle of the night. So why don't you put an external drain? You would save the patient's life quicker. Uh, the idea is this, if he has put an external drain, then there's a next step to do, which is accession of the tumor, which he cannot do. So again, a boss telling his students, his resident, that this is the way to treat these cases is a crime and it should stop. And this is a major crime, bilateral BP shunt, for craniopharyngeal. I would not accept this for my baby. You would not accept it for your child, boy or a girl. Endoscopy, I believe strongly endoscopy. I think endoscopy uh, in the, is, is, is the future of neurosurgery. And so many beautiful papers, so many beautiful work by the endoscopists around the world. Uh, I know most of them. Uh, and this is a picture here. A beautiful anatomy, beautiful approach, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a long curve of learning, but it's very good, and it is the future of the neurosurgery. So, whether you are doing it micro neurosurgery or doing it with the endoscopy, it's just the same. Go for radical accession. From the endoscopy point of view, you see the blood vessels from the low well, and in, in the craniotomy, I see the blood vessels from above well. So, each one has an advantage. These are some of the pictures. Uh, of the endoscopy. This is the third ventricular uh, cavity. Uh, again, this is a paper from Pablo Cavabianca from uh, Napoli, Italy, of uh, uh, taking these tumors out. A very important landmark paper from Amin Kassam talking about uh, the uh, types of craniopharyngioma involvement of the third ventricle. A beautiful paper uh, that would give you insight of how to do and how to deal with these cases. Again, the aim here, endoscopically or microsurgically, the aim is radical accession. Uh, again, this is a new paper from, not a new paper, a paper from Japan, 2010, World the Neurosurgery, endoscopy, 70% gross total resection, 80%, and near total, 18%, subtotal, 2. Most craniopharyngiomas are good for that approach. Again, the group of uh, endoscopists from uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Schneiderman, Gardner, endoscopic Indonesian surgery for craniopharyngioma. And you look at the, the, the results, beautiful. Uh, endoscopic Indonesian approach for craniopharyngioma from Italy, from 
my friend Giorgio Frank. Expanded endoscopic surgery, uh, some neurosurgery 2019 by Fred Gentili uh, from Toronto, Canada. Uh, now I will take you through a quick uh, journey through my personal series. And I would mention this as a starter. In USA, which is 260, I think 300 million population, uh, they diagnose 120 cases per year. Uh, so in average, the neurosurgeon should see one case every two to three years. So uh, these are not common tumors and to, to have a good number of patients uh, needs luck. I was lucky. I operate upon 102 cases and not only this number, but a higher number than this one. These are the numbers I operated and I had good long follow up on them. Uh, and the majority were children. And this was very notorious that the size were for more, more than four centimeters was the majority. Uh, solid cases, 38. Mixed cases, 52. Size more than four is 74. These are uh, the cases. They are large. So this is the kind of, of lesions that we deal uh, with. Tell me, what would you do here? with Omega Reservoir or with, uh, with radiation in any, in any sort. So surgery is the best here. And these are my series of these giant craniopharyngiomas. And the coronal section. really giant and provocative and dangerous cases. And the sagittal. Look at this case in particular uh, from the third ventricle down to from a magnum. Same thing here, solid part and cystic part from the phenomenon of Monroe for an magnum and look at this horrible thing going everywhere example a collective example of this 12 year old male patient with this extensive tumor and this 23 year old female with this extensive tumor uh, so uh, the peaks of cranial pharyngiomas is, as, as you know, is between five and 14 in the young age and 50 to 70. This is the youngest patient in my series and this is the oldest patient. Uh, all cases are uh, subjected to historic, history, physical examination, images, visual assessment, endocrine assessment and psychological assessment. It's a teamwork again. Uh, endocrine, we do all the in, uh, hormonal uh, in battery of investigations of uh, pituitary functions and hypothalamic pituitary axis, uh, urine osmolality, septum osmolality. Uh, we do CT scan to see any calcifications. So these are all my, in the, in the, my series, brain MRI, MRA, MRV as one unit. And the visual assessment, we use the German uh, school of uh, assessment of the visual acuity and visual defect, putting them together, visual fields and uh, optic OCT, evoked potential responses, and most importantly, we do psychological analysis, not only the Karnofsky performance scale, but all kinds of, of uh, psychological assessment. Uh, this is the kind of specimen that we remove because we go for radical excision. And this is the immunohistochemistry that we do for all cases. Uh, as I said, we published this paper in the Journal of Pathology, which I showed you at the beginning. Uh, malignant transformation is reported, but uh, fortunately we did not have any malignant transformation in my series, but in literature it was identified in 23 cases. Uh, this is another paper about malignant transformation of cranial pharyngiomas. Some of the illustrative cases for you. <clears throat> I call this the Hiroshima and Nagasaki of uh, cranial pharyngiomas. It looks like the uh, the bomb itself, and this is an operative picture and this post-operative. 
So we went for a radical excision. Uh, this tumor extending, as I said, from the floor of the third down to the foramen magnum. We went in and excised it completely. And this five-year-old male patient, 13-year-old patient from Yemen with this extensive tumor. Again, look at here, the floor of the third ventricle is missing. It's not missing. It has been pushed aside by the tumor. So there is no neurological or endocrinological major effect on this in this boy from Yemen. Uh, this patient came to me from Iraq. He's a son of a surgeon, general surgeon, but this extensive tumor, again, extending this way. And uh, this is post-operative, no radiation, no shunts, no omega reservoirs, nothing. This lady from Libya uh, with this um, with the major loss of vision, when she came, again, we went in for radical excision. Again, what is the floor of the third ventricle here? It's being pushed aside by the tumor. This patient from Libya with this extensive tumor, uh, solid mainly, again, excision. I use the uh, interhemispheric approach, transbasal. Uh, 15 year old male patient from Sudan with this extensive tumor. And this is post-operative. Uh, this patient uh, from uh, United, uh, from Qatar, with this, uh, uh, from Bahrain, sorry, with this uh, tumor, extensive tumor. Again, here the radical excision and him being well without radiation. Uh, follow up of this patient. This patient from uh, Bahrain uh, with this uh, tumor. Uh, uh, retrochiasmatic, retrocellular. Uh, they had attempt at it uh, somewhere uh, in the world and they just caused uh, an aneurysm of the carotid. Uh, she was referred to us. Uh, we neutralized the aneurysm by coiling. We went in and removed the tumor completely and she was sent home. Uh, the story of my life is this boy, the three-year-old male patient whom I saw back in the year 2000. Uh, with this extensive tumor that I removed completely and I gave no radiation, following up in 2003, 2005, no recurrence, 2007, 2009, 2012, no recurrence, 13, 14, 17, no recurrence. And looking at him, it gives me the pride of my life. And this is him 20 years later in the university. Uh, uh, other uh, cases with the, with the, that has been operated upon before. So even if it is recurrence, we still go on. Again, a shunt which is poorly placed for no good reason uh, to save the patient's life, as they say, which is a big lie. It's always they use this term. We did this to save the patient's life. And I said, you could have saved him by just putting external drain, but you did not put external drain because you were expected to do surgery and you could not do the surgery. Simple as that. So we went in and completely removed the tumor. He was actually referred to us for radiation. So this is post-operative. Uh, this uh, uh, girl, or, uh, this male patient, 25 year old patient with this extensive tumor, as I said, from the foramen of Monroe down to foramen magnum. Uh, again, we uh, did surgery and we removed it completely using the uh, transbasal interhemispheric approach. Uh, does radical excision prevent recurrence? Of course not, but you minimize the recurrence and you minimize, uh, minimize the procedures. And I show you some of these recurrent cases in my hands. Uh, this uh, three-year-old female patient who came to us from the uh, West Bank of uh, Palestine. Uh, and this is the tumor before surgery and this is the tumor after surgery. She did well. It was ad adamantinoma and she disappeared for uh, long period of time, two years, and then she came up with this extensive uh, recurrence. What should you do? Go for surgery again and just follow it up without radiation, without a shunt, without anything. Uh, total resection, I've done 84, subtotal resection 19. Of course, even in the radical resection, you get recurrence, I've got 11, but the recurrence is more in the subtotal resection. I had mortality in this group and mortality in this group. I will share one of these cases with you. I think I have put it, I, I'll see it now. 
morbidity, of course, like in other cases and other series, subdural uh, hygroma, hydrocephalus, uh, wound leak, CSF wound leak, meningitis. Uh, as I said, all these patients, they would have worsening of their endocrine function postoperatively, and then they recover, but they still have some, some problems there. Uh, obesity, I will allude to, as I said, seizures, uh, permanent worsening of vision was in 1.8%. Two mortalities, as I said, this is one of them. And this patient was operated somewhere else, sent elsewhere. Again, they have done nothing. They just punctured the cyst, was adventinoma. He came to me and I did radical surgical excision and he was well for a few days, but then a slow deterioration and died in the seventh post-operative day. What about obesity? As I said, two times, preoperative or postoperative, i.e. either patient come with obesity before you handle him, and usually there is no subsequent loss. But those who develop obesity after surgery, there's usually subsequent weight loss. And I'll show you this. All my patients, this female patient went into obesity and then in two years it disappeared. This patient obesity and disappeared. Same thing here, disappeared. Same thing here and disappeared. Look at this, obesity and disappeared. Same thing, obesity disappeared. Same thing, obesity pass operative and then disappeared. Same thing here. While in adults and older patients, I did not see this phenomenon. I did not see obesity in spite of radical excision of the tumors, whether males or females, adults usually they don't develop obesity in the post period after radical excision. Uh, steps of surgery, this is the terional approach. This is how you approach uh, these lesions. Uh, Transbasal interhemispheric approach like this, because you want to get to the lamina terminalis, which is the rhomboid uh, space here. This paper, beautiful paper by uh, Tomasello from Italy, from Rome. And this is uh, still pictures from my cases, but you can see optic nerve, nerve, chasm, and tract. You can see the laminar terminal sponging with the tumor and the reliquous membrane and the basal artery termination. Here I'm showing you a picture of one of my patients with the stalk with some uh, a, a, a attachment of the tumor into the stalk, but it was not invaded. So I actually uh, dissected this attachment and I did not sacrifice the stoke, but I would not have hesitated for a second if the stoke was timorous to uh, excise it. So this is the, the stoke, this is optic nerve chasm and the basilar and its termination uh, at the end of the surgery. Now we'll show you a video. We'll show you the video now. Uh, uh, some of the salient features of some of the cases uh, just to make the points that we mentioned uh, are credible and that it is possible. Uh, so this is not one case, or so this is a school of thought, this is a way of doing things. This is the lamina terminalis, and here I'm finding a plane of cleavage. I'm going for a collection, and I found in my experience that usually uh, they don't have strong attachment, the wall of the, uh, of the craniofacial lymphomas don't have strong attachment to the posterior fossa structures, but they have strong attachment to the supratentorial structures, optic apparatus and carotid. So this is the liquid membrane and stoke being preserved and the basal. Here we have the prefix chiasm. Uh, I'm trying to find the laminar terminalis here, trying to find an area with avascularity to, to go through and then puncture it and the uh, cyst flow will come out. This is what people usually do and they just stop there. This is nonsense because this fluid is gonna come back within two weeks. Even if you put uh, Omaya Reservoir and aspirate it, it will lock, it will clog and you have to revise it. So here I'm finding a good plan of a cleavage. Why should I hesitate in doing it? Why should I decide preoperative that I'm going for partial resection? I decide intraoperative. If I don't plain, find a plane of cleavage, I will stop. But I would pursue to remove every ion of this tumor. For me, this is an enemy I want to defeat. 
and the only way to defeat it is to kill it, to take it out from my patient. So patience, perseverance, and then you can achieve what you want. But if you are a mediocre surgeon, if you don't want to understand the anatomy and the physiology of that area, if you don't want to bother looking for a plane of the cleavage, this is a good plane of the cleavage from the cleft cerebri. If you leave this, no amount of radiation would help the patient. You will make him miserable. Uh, but if you do this and it recurs, then there is a place for radiotherapy and radiosurgery. Is the stroke being preserved? Again, it is not tumorous, so I leave it. But if it is, I would actually uh, sacrifice it. So this is the final picture. You can see the whole structures in front of you. Another um, case where the laminar terminalis was open, the flow was aspirated. This is not enough. So you have to go here. The, the stroke is tumorous, so no hesitation. I cut it completely. And then I proceed with the resection from the walls of the uh, lateral ventricle. Uh, this is interhemispheric approach, transbasal. I'm dissecting the arachnoid between the two hemispheres. Then proceed. Again here, I'm finding the laminar terminalis. This is ACOM here. And this is the tumor. Again, puncturing the cyst is nothing. It is, to me, is not at all doing any justice to the patient. So taking this fluid out is nothing. Your aim is to remove the, the, the cause of this fluid, which is the capsule of the tumor. And then you proceed with that. Patience, perseverance, good anatomical knowledge, good experience. So here we are. Stoke is involved, no hesitation. I cut it. So I work pre chiasm and post chiasm into the laminar terminalis. I sometimes deliver the tumor from behind to the front or from the front to the laminar terminalis according to the attachment. Here I'm using the laminar terminalis to deliver the tumor and this is ACOM. I use the ultrasonic aspirator without hesitation, without fear. Even if it is calcified, I use that with careful uh, power and careful direction of the ultrasonic aspirator. Because sometimes you need that because sometimes they have really very hard calcification. So go for total radical excision all the time. And this is the final appearance. Mesilar artery, the depth. This is a recurrent case, a recurrent case of mine. Actually, I did radical excision, but it recurred, and I'm now doing the uh, transpasal approach to uh, dissect it again. Uh, you may think the uh, recurrence would be more difficult. Uh, in fact, I did not find this observation. I think even if there is recurrence, still you can find a good plane of the cleavage. So here we are using the laminar terminalis, moving in the front and behind. Stroke is involved, I remove, and I carry on to remove the tumor, finding good plane of the cleavage in most of these recurrent cases. That's the last and the rest. Last case, and we are finished. Uh, this extensive tumor of craniopharyngioma. Here is the uh, fluid part. Again, taking that part means nothing to me. It's just part of surgery, but it is not the surgery itself. So you are in all the spaces that you know, optical, carotid, whatever, transphasal to the uh, 
achieve the goal, which is radical excision of the tumor. Remembering that the adhesions with the posterior fossil structures are very, very little. Uh, so this is the major adhesion here to these major structures. You can see the carotid here in the depth. Here I find the stalk embedded in the tumor. I look for the section to preserve it. I spend a lot of time trying to preserve it. It is not involved, it's been pushed. So I preserve the stalk and I continue my work to achieve radical excision of the tumor. It is not important to remove the fluid part. It is the most important is to remove the solid part and the capsule to give the patient the best chance of recovery and cure and living good normal life instead of the misery of frequent uh, procedures and the blockage of the shunts and the Meyer reservoirs that people are counting on because they are mediocre surgeons, they cannot do the surgery. It's a carotid, carotid, triple carotid. Uh, base. Here we are working pre charismatic And again, look at this. If you leave this, no amount of radiation would help. None. You're just dooming the patient to a miserable life. I would uh, again here show you the attachment here to the stroke. Uh, you can dissect it and remove it completely. Uh, with this, I finish and I would just conclude by making some uh, conclusions uh, that the anatomy and the extent of the tumor would dictate the approach. Which approach? It depends on the extent, but there are factors that favor the recurrence adenomatoma more than the any papillary type, brain invasion, incomplete surgical excision, tumor size bigger than four, high KI67 are those factors that favors recurrence. Radical removal should be done in tumors not involving hypothalamus. But how can you tell? You can only tell intraoperative. You may have an idea preoperative, but the only way to tell is intraoperative. And then here is the intentional incomplete removal and in those that are not involving. Uh, using microscopy or endoscopy, the aim should be a radical excision. Uh, one should not go for radical excision uh, no matter what just to present good post-operative MRI. Uh, remember that even if you do radical excision, there is, should be, there is still some recurrence, but, but you know, this is the way of thinking. This is the state of mind that when you go to surgery. With this, I finish and I'm happy to uh, uh, deliver the microphone to my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Osdeman, to talk about the uh, radio uh, surgery for these uh, lesions. Corey, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Professor. This was an excellent, excellent uh, presentation. Um, and uh, after you, I would like to share um, with you the... As you can hear, uh, see from the heading, uh, the limited role of gamma knife in cranial pharyngeometry. So uh, from uh, Professor Sbae's uh, presentation, we have learned very clearly that uh, the goal of Crying for tumor treatment uh, is uh, to get rid of the tumor, uh, to eliminate neural uh, compression and uh, also to prevent uh, recurrences while preserving the quality of life, uh, which should be uh, preserved the visual uh, outcome, uh, the endocrine function, and also the intellectual function of these patients. Uh, in adults, um, there have been few um, meta-analyses in the recent years and uh, all studies are uh, very clearly showing that gross total resection uh, gives a, a much superior a much more superior outcome compared to uh, subtotal resections uh, the work in world neurosurgery in 2019 uh, shows that recurrences are like eight to nine times uh, more common uh, after subtotal resections, uh, but uh, the incidence of panhypopituitarism or the diabetes insipidus, which can be treated medically, uh, are uh, higher in, in gross total resections. Uh, same was also shown uh, also in a very large, uh, very comprehensive study uh, looking at adult cranial pharyngiomas again. This study shows that uh, gross total resection is uh, superior to subtotal resection plus uh, radiotherapy, uh, but also shows, has, uh, shows us that um, 
Radiation therapy also adds uh, to the uh, function outcome in uh, subtotal resec uh, resected cases. So uh, radiation therapy, external beam radiation therapy has uh, some role in the uh, treatment of these lesions. Um, ben, uh, in a, uh, also a study by Shukri, uh, he also uh, noted that hypothalamic invasion is the major uh, limitation for, for a gross total resection. And uh, using a gross total resection uh, with an aggressive surgery, the uh, chances of neuro neurological deficits are five times higher and endocrinopathies are about four times higher. Uh, looking at the general literature uh, from this, at this review, from 2012, 2011. So uh, coming to the conclusion, radiation has a role in subtotal resection in craniopharyngiomas. But as you know, there are two types of radiation. One can be a fractionated radiation treatment, long-term fractionated ra radiation treatment, which has a, a much bigger radiation field, uh, also encompasses the surrounding tissues. Uh, but uh, gives this radiation in, in a long extended period to uh, limit or to uh, decrease the side effects related to the radiation. In the contrary, uh, radio surgery only gives radiation to uh, a selected uh, target, uh, therapeutic radiation to, the, to a selected uh, target inside the brain. So uh, in this uh, issue, radio surgery is inferior to uh, fractionated radiation uh, therapy in the treatment of craniopharyngiomas. Uh, why is that? It's because of three things. Number one is the location uh, of, of, this, uh, of these tumors. These are suprasellar uh, lesions very close to uh, optic apparatus or uh, either vital structures like the hypothalamus um, and uh, tissues around the third ventricle. Secondly, um, size is a problem because more, uh, these uh, craniopharyngiomas tend to be cystic uh, in, uh, in behavior. And uh, when you deal with, uh, with a cystic lesion, you automatically uh, treat a large uh, tumor uh, when you try to treat them. The third one is uh, imaging. Uh, during imaging, uh, during on MRI, uh, oftentimes it's difficult uh, to define the optic apparatus. And also uh, the boundaries of a cystic tumor when the, uh, the walls of the cyst are uh, very thin uh, and very uh, delicate. Uh, looking at uh, the studies that have uh, analyzed the work on, uh, on, uh, on the use of uh, gamma knife treatment for, uh, for craniopharyngiomas, I came across two large studies uh, dealing with a large number of cases over a long extended period of times that were treated in the uh, recent years. One of them uh, is this uh, Japanese study who has, uh, who, which was a, a multi-center study uh, encompassing 16 different Japanese centers and uh, spanning 242 patients, which is a very large uh, case number for, for such a series. But as you can, um, see uh, from the numbers at the bottom, uh, the, these numbers are not comparable uh, to the results that gamma knife uh, treatment uh, can achieve in, uh, in treatment of uh, different lesions such as meningiomas uh, or, uh, or other lesions. So uh, the outcome is far uh, inferior to uh, radiosensitive lesions. Uh, if it's the right word to use. In the uh, other study uh, published by Li, which, is, uh, which comes from Taipei, uh, from Taiwan, uh, they uh, analyzed their uh, 20 years of progress in the treatment of uh, these uh, lesions. And uh, as you can see, the five-year progression-free survival and the 10-year progression-free survival are around the same range. At five years, it's about uh, 70%. Uh, at 10 years, it falls below uh, 50% uh, range. Uh, at Ajivadam, at our university, we have a large experience on, uh, on gamma knife treatments, but among our cases, uh, because of a reason, uh, gamma knife treatment for craniopharyngiomas are only a very small minority. We only treat very selected cases uh, with this treatment. 
uh, I would like to give you a few examples. This is a, a three-year-old uh, girl uh, who presented to uh, clinical attention with this uh, cystic supracellular uh, cryopharyngioma. The patient was uh, operated and we are seeing the time course here. Uh, the, the lesion was resected. Uh, one year, uh, one and a half years after the resection, you start seeing uh, as some uh, regrowth out at the base of the cella, which grows over time. Uh, but because of the age of the patient, uh, we, uh, not, not us, but uh, um, the referring uh, university who sent us the patient, uh, decided to watchfully, uh, like, do a watchful uh, follow-up uh, on the patient. Uh, the patient was followed uh, for, uh, for one and a half years with unlimited growth uh, of the tumor. Eventually, uh, we gave a gamma knife treatment uh, to this lesion, which was quite limited in size, so 1.7 cubic centimeters. And the patient was eight years old uh, at the moment. So uh, the radiation was referred uh, until, until this time. So two years after uh, this treatment, uh, we are seeing that uh, we have achieved um, tumor growth control uh, for, uh, for at least two years. But long term, we are, we are still going to see. So again, I talked about the major limitations of the gamma knife treatment of uh, craniopharyngiomas. Of course, uh, we are trying to overcome uh, these limitations by improving uh, our uh, treatment protocols. Uh, one of them is, uh, was the use of the gamma knife icon machine. Uh, the icon machine is the latest generation of gamma knife. And on this one, you're seeing, uh, unlike in the former uh, gamma knife versions, the, there's a, a CT scanner, which is called a combeam, uh, combeam CT, attached to the machine, which helps us uh, to perform uh, the uh, stereotactic coordinates uh, equ acquisition using this uh, CT scan rather than uh, doing it on the MRI with the frame on. So if you uh, do the MRIs without the frame, you can limit to uh, on the on these MRI images. And second of all, uh, because uh, of the frame, we limit uh, the, uh, the quality of the MRI uh, by proxy because uh, we do not want to uh, harm the patients uh, by, uh, by doing the, uh, the MRI with the frame on. So uh, there are two ways uh, to increase the MRI image qualities uh, that you use for uh, planning for gamma knife. Secondly, uh, we started using the mask, uh, using this, um, uh, using the gamma knife icon machine, so which helps us to use uh, fractionations, uh, up to five fractions uh, for, for gamma knife treatments. Uh, so uh, this helps us to uh, even improve the protection of surrounding tissues, such as the uh, optic apparatus. Uh, nevertheless, we still uh, try to uh, define the optic apparatus very nicely on these uh, uh, gamma knife images uh, acquired at the day of uh, gamma knife treatment and try to protect uh, these, these tissues as you're seeing on, on this example again here. Um, we certainly see uh, recurrences in at the, uh, and also we see these in the majority of uh, cases that were uh, treated with gamma knife. Uh, and uh, because it was um, said um, almost 20 years ago that most of these recurrences uh, after gamma knife treatment are in the form of uh, cyst formation, uh, in, especially in uh, adamantinomatous uh, craniopharyngiomas. Uh, I would like to give an example to these. Um, here you see um, um, a supracellular uh, craniopharyngioma with uh, third ventricular uh, extension. The patient was uh, operated uh, in two sessions. One was done uh, to remove, uh, firstly, to remove the third ventricular large portion, and then uh, again uh, using an interhemispheric approach, um, um, a gross total resection of the tumor was achieved. But four years after uh, the resection, we started seeing a, a residual uh, uh, at the resection uh, bed uh, in, within the cell. So this was uh, treated uh, using uh, gamma knife treatment. It was a very small uh, recurrence of 0 0.5, uh, half a cubic centimeter. Uh, and uh, because it was, uh, although it was close to the optic uh, apparatus, it was um, safely uh, treated. Uh, the patient did well for, uh, in the beginning uh, with uh, the 
craniopharyngeum residual that was treated that you're seeing here you see a regression of the uh, of the lesion again a persistence of this regression persistence of this regression but uh, around tw two years after the uh, the treatment we, we saw again um, a cystic recurrence uh, within cella again uh, and the patient had to be uh, uh, retreated again. But um, as you're seeing from my examples, uh, most of the cases that we, are, uh, that we treat are usually very small residuals or very small uh, recurrences uh, around the optic apparatus. Uh, here you're seeing another example, uh, a small uh, residual 0.6 cubic centimeters in a six-year-old female, uh, and again an adenomantinomatous cranioparigioma. Uh, you're seeing that the treated lesion here uh, but uh, a very quick cyst formation six months uh, after the gamma life treatment, which uh, progressed and the patient had to be uh, reoperated at 19 months uh, after the gamma life treatment. Uh, so this is not an ex unexpected uh, occurrence in uh, craniopharyngiomas. Uh, so what do we do uh, at the time of recurrence? The treat, uh, uh, again, the first option uh, is reoperation uh, for these patients. Uh, which is again uh, probably the best option uh, to uh, when compared to the other ones. Uh, fractionated uh, external beam radiation treatments can be given. Um, as a palliative treatment, uh, the Omaier reservoirs can be placed, gamma nav can be given, and also some experimental treatments are on the way for uh, some of these, uh, these two tumors. Coming to the conclusion, uh, surgery is the treatment of choice for craniopharyngiomas and gross total resection should be attempted during the first operation. Um, and in cases where gross total resection cannot be achieved due to hypothalamic invasion, external beam fractionated radi radiation treatment uh, is the treatment choice, uh, not the gamma nav treatments. Uh, gamma nav can only be attempted in the, um, if the optic system uh, can be visualized uh, and the tumor can be visualized in uh, in relation to the optic system. And uh, gamma nav can be uh, used to support multimodal treatments at the time of recurrences in patients that have been multiple, uh, operated multiple times and uh, who have failed uh, multiple uh, treatment, uh, treatment trials. So uh, in the end, uh, I would like to add a few slides uh, on the uh, on uh, maybe coming new uh, treatments about the uh, uh, craniopharyngiomas. Here you're seeing an example of two types of craniopharyngiomas. Uh, in the upper line, you're seeing the adamantinomatous craniopharyngiomas, which are commonly seen in the children and uh, also seen in the adults uh, over 45 years of age. And below you're seeing the popular craniopharyngiomas, uh, which are mostly seen in the adult population over uh, 45 years of age. But these two types of craniopharyngiomas were, um, were uh, like, uh, defined very, very long time ago at the uh, beginning of, the, of our history with the treatment of craniopharyngiomas. Uh, but very recently, in the last five years, uh, the uh, pathology uh, or the uh, pathophysiology of these, treat, uh, of these, of these diseases are, uh, started, uh, are st being started to uh, understand. And uh, we are developing due to uh, some malfunction in the beta catenin uh, pathway. But um, the papillary crime pharyngiomas are developing uh, to a malfunction in the RASREF MAP kinase uh, pathway. And in these cases, uh, the BREF V600E mutation, this is a very strict uh, mutation in one single uh, nucleic acid uh, in the uh, nucleotide in the, uh, in the uh, genetic code of these tumors. And this can be uh, easily shown uh, using uh, molecular biology uh, techniques or using immunosechemistry as you're seeing on this example. But understanding these uh, biologies uh, gave uh, the researchers some opportunities to uh, also treat these lesions. And uh, in the uh, last five years, uh, new uh, treatments using targeted uh, therapies have started uh, emerging. And uh, in 2019, uh, started, uh, some se uh, case series started to emerge. And 
uh, these are showing that uh, these type of treatments uh, aiming for the resref kinase uh, pathway, not in the uh, adenomantinotose, but in the papillary, in the papillary type that we commonly see in the adult population, may be an option uh, in cases that have failed surgery or we have recurred after surgery. Not as frontline treatment, but as a, uh, as a uh, last resource in these patients. But it shows us that uh, there may be some uh, new treatments uh, in the future. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance uh, and uh, attention. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, hand over the oh, floor, uh, to Professor Sbey again. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. And um, we complement each other from the microsurgical point of view and the surgical point of view. I think we have the same ideas that surgery is the mainstay of the uh, management and that radiation uh, is the second uh, line of management. Uh, Omar and the rest are just palliative uh, measures. So we are in total agreement. Uh, John, we are open for any questions if you have from any of the viewers. Yeah, I'm here. I'm Sami Khatib from Jordan. Hello, and hi, okay. hi from the Dead Sea. Uh, really, I'm happy today for the excellent lecture, Professor Sudeh. <laughs> and uh, Prof. Korai, uh, I think we are totally agree that uh, Gamma Knife has a very, very limited role uh, in the craniopharyngioma. So uh, best option is the surgery to be completed when needed with uh, the radiotherapy. Thank you for both of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And this is coming from uh, radiation oncologist is, is very important. Any other questions? Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, this great uh, presentation. Um, both uh, the, uh, the surgical point of view and the uh, gamma knife. Uh, I'm totally, uh, uh, completely agree with you that this tumor uh, is uh, surgical and uh, should be called uh, totally uh, uh, total resection because as you told we don't know uh, the exact uh, uh, invasion of the tumor that's in operation when we do we do, we do it uh, mm -hmm. but if we go with idea to do subtotal resection that's the war is uh, <laughs> uh, lost. yes yes lost. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for agreeing with us because this is the right way of thinking that if you have, if you go intentionally beforehand, you decided to yourself that I'm going to go for small resection and then go for radiotherapy, then this is yes. the bad approach. And as I said, we have lost the battle before we started it. Yes. So, so uh, I, I want to add that uh, the, another point that, that uh, uh, you pointed. Uh, th this surgery is not for young surgeon. No. It's for uh, a senior surgeon or surgeon with great experience, uh, with a, a, a team, as you told, a team dedicated to uh, uh, the hypophysal uh, tumor region. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, the point is here: this that just. Uh, for the young generations, when they hear that the radical excision is equal to the partial excision radiotherapy, they miss the point that this is if done by experienced craniopharyngioma surgeon. Mm -hmm. If I have to do it as experienced neurosurgeon and I fail to achieve radical excision, then I would accept to go to do rad uh, subtotal and radiotherapy. But they take the word as it is and they just translate it in their minds that, okay, so I will go just for puncture, for my reservoir, for shunt, and then give radiotherapy. And this is the danger. We keep uh, telling people that we have to change this state of mind because it is the wrong way of thinking about it. Thank you for your comments, Dr. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, more questions or comments from the panel? Don't be shy. People quiet today. <laughs> <laughs> it's Wednesday. 
Um, I have a question for you, Professor Sebe. Sure, uh, sure. What is your, um, like, what's uh, your approach of uh, dissecting the tumor out from the hypothalamus or the optic nerves? Like, what, what uh, how do you do it? Like, what technique do you use it? Do you do sharp dissection or like, do you peel it off by uh, pushing with uh, cotton paddies? Sure. Uh, I use both. I use the uh, blunt dissection. I use the sharp dissection according to what I see. But what I do is I've never went in having decided what to do with the patient. I decide what I'm going to do intraoperatively. So I go pre chiasm I go to the laminar terminalis, I go into the optical carotid recess, trying to find a good plane of activity. Once I find one, I continue do, doing the dissection. But sometimes you really have to do a sharp dissection. And I frequently use the ultrasonic aspirator to take a very hard piece that is attached to the chiasm. But if I find that it is really going into the carotid wall or going into the chiasm itself, I stop simply as that. So I don't stop from the very first obstacle. Um, the tumor is obstinate, I'm more obstinate than the tumor. I find the tumor, as I told you the last time, I, I, I just make a, uh, an enemy out of the tumor and I curse them and fight with them, struggle with them. And, you know, you just sometimes be surprised that the plan of cleavage opens for you. But I use all sorts of dissection tricks, sharp, blunt, the ultrasonic aspirator. I don't raise the flag unless I really, really have given the patient his best chance. Um, is there room for a second question? Of course. Uh, how, how do you uh, choose for your approach? Like when do you approach from, uh, from the uh, transbasal subfrontal approaches? Uh, when do you go uh, interhemispheric? Do you only go for the third ventricle part uh, when you go interhemispheric? Yes, I use the interhemispheric when there is a major the third ventricular part. And the major third ventricular part is two times. And that is false, sort of the tumor has pushed the third ventricle uh, floor up or it is really intraventricular. So I studied the image as well and if I find that it is truly intraventricular, it has pushed the mammillary bodies aside and went in, I use the transbasal approach. If it is a small and it is extraventricular, I use the teleonal approach. Um, do you ever use the combined approach as Professor Yashaldin has shown, uh, like uh, teleonal? I I did not need to because you know Never once you go in for one approach it, you know you will be you will achieve what you want to do and the transvasal approach interhemispheric transvasal approach is very versatile you go into any area of the uh, the um, pathology you need pre chasm post chasm to the laminar terminalis uh, i had to cut the uh, anterior um, communicating uh, uh, Archie in two cases to f find a good space, but you know, you find a good space and you can go right, left, anterior and posterior. So it's a very good versatile approach for large tumors with a major part of the tumor inside the third ventricle. Uh, and the prepontine extensions, extension uh, beyond the dorsum yes. cell, uh, lower yeah. to the dorsum cell. It's, Do you it's easy. Trans, yeah, <laughs> transbasal and I go into through the laminar terminalis into the Deliquist the brain, and I see the dorsum cell, and I, I go into the posterior fossa. And my observation: I've never ever had any tumor attached to the basal or the cranial nerves in the posterior fossa. No adhesions there. And there is an explanation of this because the origin of the tumor is not there. The origin of the tumor is in the uh, pouch in the cella and the subcellular area. So that's where you find the adhesions with the optic apparatus of the carotid arteries but never, in my experience, to the posterior fossa structures. Thank you. Pleasure. More comments, questions? Yes, I have a comment, a yeah. question. Yeah, hello. Go ahead, hello. Dr. Zaid, go ahead. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, Dr. Subah, uh, as usual, uh, remarkable and amazing and to the point. Uh, I have a small question for you only. In the recurrence cases, you didn't find some adhesions to the posterior circulation? No, uh, <clears throat> absolutely. Never. Not absolutely. even in the recurrence? Not even in the recurrence. I have never seen any adhesions, whether a primary tumor or a recurrent tumor to the posterior fossa structures. That means you are going 
uh, directly to take all the adhesions from the beginning. Yes. That's why you didn't have any recurrence, because some people are claiming that uh, in the recurrences, sometimes uh, they find that there are more adhesions in the posterior circulation and the yeah. subchasmatic uh, cisterns. Absolutely not. Not in my experience, at least. Well, that's because you was removing, attending to removing, to removing it totally from the posterior circulation, Absolutely. and you didn't leave it. The people who left it. something, the people who left something in the posterior circulation, maybe at that ma at that time it got that error. Yes, the idea okay. is this: is uh, if they just face a little struggle, if they face a little problem, uh, they would stop because they have intentionally decided not to proceed. Uh, so whenever they find any problem, they would stop. Oh, it is adherent. Oh, it is large. Oh, it is this, that, and the other. It is the state of mind. It is what you want you to do. Well, actually, actually, the action of pulling the sack in the way you are showing in your videos sometimes uh, puts you in a way uh, being afraid that you are pulling something from the posterior circulation that you don't know what's going to happen blindly behind. And that's why maybe some people are afraid and telling that, okay, if I pull more, maybe I will, I will cause bleeding, I will, uh, I will, I will, uh, I will rupture one of the perforators, uh, patient may have problem. So they okay. excise the part that yeah. they cannot see, and maybe yeah. that's why it is, uh, it is the case. But I mean, said it, that the, the bread and butter, the, the, the secret of this is the adhesions where the tumor has originated. And as we know, it has originated from the, from the pouch. So it is either in the cellar or in the supracellar area. Nothing is inside the surface. So people who would go transventricular, lateral ventricular, to the foramen of Monroe, to the tumor, it's a long, long way. And they are not dealing with the root of the problem, which is the adhesions of the tumor. So once you tackle that in the uh, chiasmatic area, in the laminar terminalis, decrease the adhesions, then you can actually look pre-chiasm and post-chiasm and see whether there are adhesions. But that's what I used to do in the past, is to look and look and look. And then I came to the conclusion, oh, well, I did not see any adhesions. So I start to pull and it just work out very nicely. Fine. Well, uh, my question to Dr. Ortsman, uh, very nice uh, presentation. And I was really satisfied as a surgeon from your comments, uh, because I also subscribe to the group of Dr. Ibrahim, uh, not to give chance for uh, rad radiation, especially in such sensitive area. Absolutely. But what do you think about uh, the papers talking about the proton beam uh, therapy now? Great for you. Uh, tell you to, I have not read any um, any papers on the use of proton beam uh, uh, on for for use in craniopharyngiomas. Well, I'm afraid I, I'm, I'm weak on this subject. There, there, are, there are some people claiming complete uh, remissions after the proton beam, even with a uh, little bit um, sizable tumors, uh, and even with patients came with blindness, and they became 20-20 uh, uh, back again. So I, I really want uh, the opinion for that, either from you or from Dr. Uh, yeah, I've read a few papers about the uh, proton beam therapy in craniofaryngiomas. And there was one paper which uh, compared the proton beam with the conformal uh, radiation and with gamma knife. And they concluded mm -hmm. that there is no much difference between the three options. But there is one point mm -hmm. to remember. How many countries in the world they have the proton beam? And how much yes. does it cost? So this that's is an what, important option. This is an that's important my, that's, That was my second question. Yeah. Because I don't know until now, where are the proton beam uh, therapy centers in the world? Five, I, five, I have no idea. Just, just five centers in the world, three in the United States, two in Europe. And I had a case recently of uh, Clivus Cordoma, which mm -hmm. I did a uh, radical excision, and I wanted to send for proton beam because I think this is the best for Clivus Cordomas. Uh, we contacted the United States, and they asked the patient to pay $250,000 in advance as a down Ooh. payment. So this is too well, much uh, for people to try. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abdullah. Uh, Professor Speyer. Yes. Uh, I saw that you had, um, as a, a complication is not a big complication, the subdural hematoma. Uh, 
Uh, I had some rumors. yes, I had I had rumors. Yes, I had some problem in two in two patients with a great uh, um, uh, giant craniofemoral uh, tumor, and, and um, the trick uh, um, uh, from um, uh, Necker's team is to put the drainage in the large craniofemoral to put the drainage before surgery. For me. Uh, it was logical to don't put uh, the the, um, uh, the drainage because uh, the the tumor is the retroactor. The, yes. But uh, it seems to 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 work. Yeah, uh, I did not need to put any um, drainage into the cavity mm. to treat yes. these hygromas. Uh, I think you know, like any other intraventricular uh, surgery, when you open the ventricle and the CSF would go into the subdural space. There's always this problem. Yes. Uh, if, yeah. I'm, if I'm dealing with the lateral ventricle, then initially in my career, I used to put a kind of Follis catheter or Fugati catheter, inflate it so that it would take the cortex up. But mm. recently, I did not need to just keep observation and give them steroids and it will disappear. Yes, I, I talk about, uh, not about treatment of igroma. I talk uh, pre-operative, to, to avoid, uh, I had subdural hematoma. Sure, I agree. Two okay. cases. Yeah, yeah. To, to, to avoid like this, uh, they proposed to put the drainage, the ventricular end. drainage before surgery. Sure, sure. Maybe, so, maybe they are right. Like, I, <laughs> I did not think like, to. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, there's a question from the audience. I cannot uh, can't tell the name. HKG, and he says, do you remove the orbital rim for basal interhemispheric approach? And the answer is no. You don't need to. You just you flush for the anterior cranial fossa base without removing the orbital rim. Okay, more questions, comments from the panel? Okay, I'd like to thank both doctors very much for taking the time. And we're going to try to use a platform called Kahoot to try to reach the remote audience. Uh, and it's interactive and all the panelists can participate. Bring your, get your smartphone out because that's how you vote. Uh, and that, that's how you answer questions. Now here's, go to the, uh, on, your, on your smartphone, go to Kahoot.it. That allows you to enter. That, that allows you to vote. Okay, I'm, and I'm starting it now, which you can see. Okay, and the pin number is 7448095. So go to the kahoot.it on your smartphone and punch in the pin number. That'll put you into the game. Like I'm gonna do it right now. I'm gonna do it, and we'll take our time here. Okay, I'm putting my I'm putting my pin in now. I'm putting seven four four eight zero oh, nine five, and I'm entering the Kahoot, and it's giving me a, a nickname. And you're going to see me come up there. I'm the elated possum. Okay, that's how I got in through my smartphone. Yeah. Hey, Lively Otter came in. Okay, keep coming in. They're dazzled deer. Very good. Okay, K A H O O T dot I T on your smartphone. It's going to allow you to answer answer questions from the presentation that Dr. Sabea and Dr. Osduman just did, and a couple other related questions. Well, come on, let's get a few more. And this also applies to the people just watching out in the internet. Okay, there's another one. Let's try to reach 10. 
If we can reach 10, we'll start it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So a couple of more, and we'll start. Okay, two more, and then we'll roll. Come on, take a chance. That's how you learn. This is a new way of education. It's going to stick around. Okay, eight's good enough. Okay, here we go. We're going to start. And it's self-explanatory. When you vote, you punch in the color on your smartphone. Okay? Oh, here we go. Just answer that question on your smartphone. And it's just a poll, it's an opinion, that's all. Okay, as you can see, uh, Dr. Sabaya, uh, three people voted for never, no, 50% voted for never, 33%. Sometimes. Can you comment on that? Is that uh, expected? <laughs> Yeah, well, yes, uh, so long that more than 50 or 50% 50 do not use it uh, or never used it, this is good because these people believe that the use of Omeya Reservoir up front is not the ideal thing to do. Omeya Reservoir insertion is palliative and should be done only in palliative situations. So uh, uh, one uh, doing it always, um, this is what I'm expecting, but this is a good figure, 50% they would never put an Omeya Reservoir. Okay, on to the next question. Well, not question, poll. Okay. What is the number of the poll again? It's kahoot.it. 744-8095, huh? Okay, uh, could you please uh, we, we listen? Just punch the color. Okay, six answers. Four with radical resection. Uh, is that pretty well what you expected, uh, Dr. Sabaya? Yeah, that's a good attitude, and uh, I'm glad to hear that and to see that, that uh, most of the voters are choosing the radical resection. This is the state of mind that we want people to go for uh, clinical angioma surgery with. I want to do radical resection. Not regardless, not at any cost, not just to present good post-operative MRIs, but because I want to help the patient avoid any extra maneuvers, any extra procedures, any radiation. And if that is my boy or my girl being treated, I would wish that the surgeon would do the same. Okay, very good. Okay, on to the next, next question. Well, it's not much to say there, even there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, people would think here in two different uh, levels. Uh, in terms of the surgical difficulty or in terms of the results uh, that one obtained. In a pediatric group of patients, we want to achieve the best for them because they are kids and children and we don't want to go for radiation, especially in the preschool age or the school age. So I accept that uh, because it's difficult. Clinical angioma is one of the most challenging, uh, demanding uh, surgeries to do. So in adult and in pediatric, it is difficult. It depends on the aim of the surgery. For me, pediatric uh, results are more important than the adult, but both are having the same uh, level of difficulty. Okay, very good. Okay, on to the next. Okay. Okay, is that surprising? 
the doc? Well, it's uh, not very much surprising. Uh, three for radiotherapy and uh, three for radiosurgery, so it's equal. But uh, I think if they have attended the lecture for today, they would have listened to Professor Osdeman saying that radiotherapy is the uh, main line of treatment for the pain of pharyngiomas. The limitations of gamma life is the uh, optic apparatus. Optic apparatus should receive a certain limit of radiation. Uh, usually it's six to seven rats, uh, less than better. And the usual new methods is to block the beams of the radiation so that you would get that. But that would distort the, uh, the treatment plan uh, in general. So uh, radio surgery, gamma knife in particular for gamma knife is not easy because of the proximity of the lesion to the optic apparatus. And here we mean optic nerve, chiasm, and the tract. They are just the same importance uh, for visual uh, complications. So um, I accept that uh, as a reality of life, but radiotherapy first and we leave radio surgery for the cases that Professor Osterman mentioned, post-operative recur, this, that, and the other, uh, and sometimes even after radiation recurrence. Okay, very good. On to the next question. Oh, this is separate from what you... Sure, sure. Okay, okay. I, I guess people like it the way it is. I guess we won't oh, change yeah. it. Good. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Okay, Nick. Okay, well, vast majority sometimes. What do yeah. you think? What do you say about that, Doc? Uh, th those who said uh, yes, all is are zero, which is good. Uh, those that said sometimes here, we have to uh, ask them about what their intentions are. Uh, was it really necessary to put it up front? We are not talking about along the line, but we are talking about up front. I am having a case of uh, craniopharyngioma causing hydrocephalus. Would I go for up front? Six people is too much because those people are thinking of not having the next step of accession of the tumor. Uh, this is not good. Uh, upfront ventricular percussions should not be used at all because you want to go for the tumor, excise it, and see whether there is a need for a shunt to start with. Uh, and those uh, people who talk about we needed to put it up front because we wanted to save the patient's life is real nonsense for me because you can save the patient's life by putting extended drain in the morning or three o'clock in the morning. Don't put a shunt. A shunt needs in the best of hands about 35, 40 minutes, one hour to put a shunt, but external drain will take five minutes. So if you are really careful about the patient's life, put an external drain and then go for the next step the following morning, take the tumor out, leave the external drain for two or three days, see whether the ventricles are coming down and the flow is all good and the pressure is good, and then you can remove them. But six people, uh, too much to uh, to put up front to to put their shots. Okay, very good. Then going and moving on. Okay, it's just just to tell me I'm overloading you with email. <laughs> People don't want to answer that. <laughs> it's anonymous. Yeah. Uh, two. Uh, just so, just so. about right. Okay, good. Yeah. That's that's good to hear. That's good to hear. And uh, okay, so uh, you know we can incorporate this, Doctor Sabay. I'm sure you'll yeah, think. think yeah. You sure next week you'll think when you're doing a present. Sure. What, what questions? What questions. points can I raise that'll? Sure. Because yeah. that really brings in the 
remote audience, not just the panelists, but people that are watching on the okay. internet. Of course, it wasn't okay. much today, but we'll get better. Sure. So, okay, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Next week we'll be doing the pineal uh, gland location tumors and lesions. Again, from the surgical point of view and from the uh, radiation radiosurgery point of view. I'll be talking about macro neurosurgery uh, for the pineal locus lesions and uh, Professor Osdeman will be talking about radiation of the pineal location. Great. And Dr. Osdeman, think of some questions you can ask next week or points, okay? And you can submit them to me and I'll, I'll put them up. So thanks everybody for coming. It was a great you. session and Thank we'll you. see you next week. Good night. Thank you. See you next week.